Now, what I'm kind of fascinated by is for someone like yourself that started her early career in journalism, quick question to that, where did that come from? Have you always wanted to be journalist? Or what about journalism really attracted you? And then from there, what, what was the catalyst? Uh, what was the tipping point for you to change your life mission or purpose that whatever you pursued up until that point moving forward, it's all about the, the, the betterment and the empowerment and the, the cultivating of the younger generation? Like, where did that come from? So going back, I think, where did I start? So I grew up, uh, my parents are immigrants. My father's from the Ukraine and my mother's from Russia, from Siberia. And so we grew up with actually no money or I did. And um, I was always, always hungry, always looking around for, you know, opportunities and so forth. And when I was about 14 years old, I realized that, you know, one of the most influential groups in the country were the journalists. And, you know, just from reading newspapers and just being aware. And I decided that I wanted to try it. I wanted to be a journalist. So I applied to a local newspaper that was a weekly. And since the price was right, I was very cheap. <laughs> um, they hired me and they paid me three cents a word. So as you can imagine, it was a real bargain for them. But for me, it was a great experience because they taught me how to write and to write all the journalism types of stories. And they did it. I think in some sense, it was self-interest. You know, it was a lot of work to go to all the city council meetings, all the local high school games, all the activities that they covered. But they could send me for three cents a word. And that was a real deal. So it was great for them, but it was also great for me. And I entered a profession where there weren't any women. I mean, I was just, a, you know, a girl Friday more than anything else. And um, I loved it. Uh, it turns out that I had a knack for writing, which I didn't even know. And it was exciting to work with these people and exciting to see my name in print. And so I started that, as I said, at 14. And I graduated from high school at 17. So I did it for three years. And in the meantime, so the first year I worked for the local weekly called Sunland Tahunga Record Ledger. And then the second year, a local newspaper in Glendale, the Glendale News Press, which doesn't exist anymore, decided to hire me to be a teenage columnist. And I was like, wow. And they paid a little bit more. I think I got $10 a column, which was a big deal for me. And then not to be outdone by the local papers, the Los Angeles Times hired me the following year <laughs> to write about teenage news. So I, I was pretty excited about this. And um, I wanted to be a journalist because I saw what influence they had and how important it was to help people understand what was really going on and not what they just heard snippets about. So when I went to college, I went to UC Berkeley. I majored in political science and English. And those were basically to just hone my skills, political science, to understand how societies were constructed, and then English, because I loved English literature. But as a graduate student, I got a master's in journalism. And um, then I decided I wanted to, to be a full-fledged journalist. You know, well, why not, after I got this degree? But um, as I mentioned, the profession at that point was only men. There was a a club or an honorary society for men, Sigma Delta Phi, I believe it was, only let men in. And then also you could get into the press club, the newspapers, they were willing to hire me, but only for one section. The newspapers used to be divided into four sections, news, opinion, sports, and women's section. There was a whole section of the paper that was just devoted to women. And it was articles about babies and marriage and cooking and cleaning and I don't know, things like that. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to write for the women's section. But I got stuck writing household tips for the women's section. Anyway, this, this was not my idea of what I wanted to do <laughs> as a journalist. So um, I didn't continue in that. And I decided 
it's just, why don't I just teach, you know, I'll teach journalism to all these young kids. And so that's how I ended up teaching at Palo Alto High School and starting that journalism program. Because I said, well, I can teach you all the skills, you know, I can have an exciting life. I don't have to just concentrate on babies and house cleaning and things like that. I can make a change. So once I started there, I really liked it. And um, every year I got more and more students. And I loved, turns out I loved working with young people. And so I'm still here doing it. Although I'm also a journalist now. (laughs) I've written for the Huffington Post for years. And then I also write for Thrive Global, Ariana Huffington's um, latest website. And then I, I wrote um two books and um i'm thinking of writing a third one so you know i've kept my journalism skills um alive and i've been very happy doing it and i think it was luck that i went into teaching journalism Mm. i've had a really positive impact on thousands of kids and that makes me very happy What do you see is the future of just education and where everything is going as to like I know education in America is probably different from Korea, but you know, we're kind of, I feel like just on a high level reaching some sort of just precipice on a general consensus of people just being more critical of, of academic institutions and universities, their role in society for someone who is all about empowering the next generation. Um, do you still think like the old way with basically preschool through college is still kind of the best way or there's no right or wrong answer here, but I'd love to kind of uh, just pick your brain. Like wh- where do you see everything going or in your opinion, if if you were to have a decision or uh, have a, have a, some sort of an opinion on that, um, like what would it be? So the question really is, where do you see the American or the world education system at the moment? I'll concentrate on the US. Well, I would say that at this particular time, the U.S. is gripped by fear in the education system because the report came out in the New York Times in October that American kids were two years behind because of the pandemic. And as a result of that report, every school in this country pretty much got rid of everything that did not focus on math and reading and forced kids to do more math and more reading, like they could catch up two years in one year or three years even, I think that that's misintent, poorly thought out. They shouldn't have done that. It's just too much stress on the kids. So they've cut out things that are important to kids like art and music and PE and focus more on these language skills and math skills. And it's so it's gotten to be more like the hogwans, actually, only it's in school. Mm. And so you have to ask, how happy are American kids now with this? And the rates of depression are highest, are the highest they've ever been. So perhaps it's not such a good idea. You know, so if they're two years behind, so what? you know, uh, they're going to catch up eventually. So that's, I think, my evaluation at the moment of the school system. I would like to see a more empathetic, relaxed view and see whether or not kids can't want to read on their own without being forced to read and understand the power of doing math well and then want to do that that's what I would do if I, you know, were in the classroom at the moment. I have 10 grandchildren and we focus on exactly what, you know, I just talked about giving them the opportunity to work on things that they care about. And so if they're a little behind, well, next year, maybe they won't be behind. Mm -hmm. And um, just because you're behind now doesn't mean you're always going to be behind. So, yeah, I don't, I really wish that I could help those teachers because the teachers are really stressed. Mm -hmm. Um, They are stressed because they think their kids aren't doing well enough and the kids are stressed and the parents are stressed. And it's like, so I think one of the things we need to look at is one of the happiest countries in the world or the happiest group of countries in the world are the Scandinavian countries, um, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, 
And the countries that score, the country, the one country that scores the highest on the PISA test, which is the personal international student assessment test that compares one country to the other is Finland. Finland, it ranks at the top, number one. And what's interesting about that is it also ranks at the top in happiness. So how could that be? Well, it turns out that happy kids and happy people learn the most. You, When you're cold, when you're hungry, when you're fearful, you don't learn. You just like want to get out of it. And kids that are unhappy or feel like they're not doing well or feel bad about themselves have a harder time learning. So, I mean, it just makes sense. You should just try. You, the parents, try to learn something. Try to learn a a few phrases in French while you're hungry or while you're miserable. See how well you do. But (laughs) I'm telling you, we need to stop doing that to our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to give them an opportunity to feel good about themselves and then present reading as an opportunity to communicate. No one can do anything well unless they can do, unless they can read. So this new AI feature that has just come out, Mm-hmm. chat gpt okay all the school districts are f- very frantic about this but let me tell you you cannot even do chat gpt if you can't read <laughs> or if you can't do any math so i mean it's a it's a motivator it could help kids want to learn and um so you know i, I th- we could probably spend another hour talking about sure. chat gpt so maybe we can do that for another session. But um, I do have some ideas on on how we can incorporate it in a way to make it productive. I also remember, so I'm, I've been around for a while, as you know, I remember when calculators came out. Mm. And you know, the schools all banned calculators. <laughs> if you carry the calculator into school, you're going to get into trouble. Mm. And now nobody cares. There's, it's built into your phone. <laughs> and so, but I mean, all these new devices that are coming out, we ne- need to learn how to live with them, not ban them. Because, you know, New York City public schools just banned chat GPT. So I would like all those people that just banned it to think about how successful prohibition was. <laughs> you know, so that's kind of an interesting thing. You know, what did they have to do? They banned all the alcohol. Well, anyway, banning doesn't work. Working with the product or whatever it is comes out as a better alternative, as a better way to, to work with it. For the audience that are very entrepreneurial that are listening, you know, you uh, have a huge track record, Esther, of just starting a lot of exciting different types of projects. I think um, for a lot of people, just starting something is extremely terrifying. So do you have advice? What would your one advice be for people who want to start this business, side business, a nonprofit, freelancing, contracting, but they're just afraid to do it? Um, maybe it's too risky. Maybe it, it costs too much money. Maybe they feel like they're going to, you know, fall backwards relative to their peers. Like what would your one advice be for folks in these situations? So I, if you have a good idea, which is a lot of people have good ideas, but if you have a good idea, the most important thing is to get one or two other people that you can work with because people don't really do a lot of great things alone. Mm-hmm. Um, I think collaboration is the key, but in picking those other people, that is the key. Like 80 to 90% of startups fail. And the reason they fail is in the execution. It is not in the idea. The idea can be very good. And then they get into fights with the other people that are in their company. And then the whole thing falls apart. So I think it's important to pick carefully. And they're all over the country. There are these things called accelerators. And what they do is that they help you start your startup if you want to have one. Um, They give you ideas. They tell you how to incorporate. They tell you how to get along with the other people. And these the startups really, they address problems in society that we need a solution for. And if 
if we didn't have startups, America would not be a very exciting place. As a matter of fact, I mean, it's one of the most creative countries on the planet. And it is because of our entrepreneurs. And we need those people to take that risk. But then, like I say, make sure you're going to work with somebody that you can trust and that it trusts you uh, because otherwise you're going to end up with problems. And it, I know, you know, I've had a few startups already, so I know that it can be problematic. What is your advice on finding like that right person or two? Um, is it typically through your network? Is it through a certain, you know, forum or event or app? Like if, if someone has an idea, they're like, wow, Esther, you're right. I need to be able to find at least, you know, one other person. What would their next steps be? Well, I think you meet these people at conferences. You can meet them at, I think probably in schools. I mean, educational institutions are good places to meet other people. Also, if you're in a workplace, and there are other people in your company that see an opportunity to do something that might be related but is different, you can also get people in the company that you're working with that might want to start up something. Mm -hmm. I think they, um, there's a lot of accelerators and startup talk in pretty much all the universities. And also in junior colleges here in California, you know, I don't know where everybody lives. You know, I don't know if all the states have these junior colleges, but they offer an opportunity to find other people that might be interested in working on the same project. You know, and these these entrepreneurs can be doing anything from, you know, making cookies that they can then sell to bakeries to, you know, doing something with AI. They can be technical. They can, there's so many um, opportunities out there and everyone in their life has something that they know needs to be better and be changed. And so they just need to think about what it is that could be better in their life and do other people in their community have the same need? And is that something that they can then help create or get or buy or whatever? I mean, I think in our world, that is hammered by climate problems. I mean, we just have one climate issue after another. What could we do that would actually make a difference in our climate issues? And if you can think of something and that other people in your community could also participate in, that would make a difference in the climate and it would make a difference in your community and make a difference in to you too. And you know, you can earn a living doing that. I think there are, there are companies out there that, I mean, I think I've heard from one where they have little biographies of people that are making a lot of money by doing something simple, one thing. Those are actually all true. They're all true stories. And it's interesting to see what those people have done and how it's made a difference in their lives and in the lives of other people with the product that they've created. I think one another one, another company that I worked with, it's called WeCare, W-E-E-C-A-R-E dot I-O. And I first met this woman when she was a young mother. She still is a young mother, but now she has more kids. But she was looking for a daycare to put her kids in and she can find one. And then what she ended up doing is she started in-home daycares. So other mothers who were at home could take care of kids, maybe five or six at a time, earn a pretty good salary and do a service for the women that were looking for daycare. And it's now, if you look it up online, it's now the largest one in the US, home daycares. You know, and these are all just mothers who might have had one or two extra rooms in their house, maybe their family room, who knows where. And they take in toddlers that are, you know, maybe, like I said, five or six. And those kids get to play together. And it's a good thing experience for them. And those mothers that are working have a place where they feel comfortable to leave their child. And 
the woman that is taking care of them earns a good living. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a win-win for everyone. So this is just an example of she had a need and she tried to figure out a solution that would work for her and then it works for other mothers. So, I mean, think about your life and what in your life could be better. And is there some way that you can help that happen for you and for your community? I appreciate the advice. Another question I have is kind of like how we talked about parenting, your view on it, educators, your view on that. In your opinion, how are founders or leaders or managers kind of falling short when it comes to just leading or managing their teams? Number one is that acronym I gave you, TRIC. I'm, the next book I'm writing is using TRIC in the corporate world or the business world because they don't trust their employees. They don't respect their ideas. They don't give them a lot of independence. There's no collaboration and they don't treat them with kindness. So all these employees want to quit. Yeah, I don't blame them. The great resignation, right? No one resigns from a company where they feel appreciated, even if the salary's low. You know, that is one of the things that's so important. I mean, everybody want, should want to work together to make the product or the service function better. I mean, if you're hired at a company, hopefully that's your goal. You know, don't take a job at a company that you hate because then you're not going to be able to work there very happily. But that's what I think leaders need to treat their employees with more trust and respect. And also, I think it's really important that there be it be um, more transparent, let's put it that way, open. So decisions are made collaboratively. You don't have just one person coming down and telling everybody what to do, and it doesn't make sense. So I think it's really important to have a collaborative workspace where you feel trusted and respected. And having been early involved with Google, I can tell you one of the reasons why Google grew the way it did is because everybody who was working there felt trusted and respected. They were given, they followed the whole trick philosophy. And, you know, if you didn't do something well, then you talk to your colleagues about it and everybody works to make it better. And the company still functions with that philosophy. And you you want employees that really care about your company and care about doing well and that you, the employer, these are human beings. They have feelings and families and a life and you want to treat them with respect, you know, and and not just... They're not objects, let's put it that way. They're human beings and they need to be treated with respect. I feel so strongly about that. That's my next book. <laughs>